Hello, everyone. Hello, we're allowing a few more participants to come in, but welcome to the Chris O'Brien Lifehouse Discovery Forum. I can see that we've got quite a few participants and people are still coming in. So thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, we're really happy to have you. Usually this forum is done IRL in real life, but we're on Zoom at the moment and I think it'll work really beautifully. Uh, my name is Juliet O'Brien. Um, I uh, do a few different things at Chris O'Brien Lifehouse, including forums like this. Um, uh, I'm Chris and Gail's daughter, and um, I'm going to basically run the forum today. Uh, and I have a little Q&A box here. I can't see you and I can't hear you, but I know that you're out there. And if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you can see a little box that says Q&A. There's no chat box, it's just Q&A. And so I will be keeping an eye on that as well as some other people at uh, Lifehouse the whole time. So if you have any questions today, please just pop them in there. So I would like to introduce our panelists. Today we're talking about head and neck cancer. And we have three great people to talk about this for the next hour or so. The first is the lovely Janine Chung, who um, has been a patient in head and neck cancer at Chris O'Brien Lifehouse. And she is a patient of Professor Karsten Palm, who is the director of the unit. And we also have uh, Gail O'Brien, who is a patient advocate and um, is also on the board of directors and um, has been involved in the philanthropy for the head and neck unit. So uh, let's get started. Um, I'd like to start with Professor pa uh, Carson Palm. I'm just going to call you Carson, if that's all right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, Carson, can we just start? Head and neck cancer is um, not always a clear term to people. It's not as clear as something like brain cancer or breast cancer. So can you tell us about what is head and neck cancer and what makes it particularly unique as a cancer group? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Juliet. And uh, thank you to everybody who's attended this panel today and also particularly Janine, you know, for, for coming along and, uh, and uh, joining us. And thank you to all the participants out there who are showing an interest in, in, in what we do. Yeah, absolutely, Juliet. Head and neck cancer is a really difficult term to, uh, to get your head around, pardon the pun. It, 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 it's not a collection, it's not one type of cancer, like you said, breast cancer or bowel cancer. It's really a collection of many different types of cancers that arise within the head and neck region. And the head and neck region for us is very much defined by the base of skull, everything in front of the spine and everything above the collarbone. So, you know, what it is not, it is not brain cancer. It is not related to the spine but it's all the other things that, uh, that uh, uh, lie in front of it. So really importantly, it's all the things that make us breathe, speak, swallow, smell, see, and hear. Incredibly critical functions for us. You know, These are cancers that arise within the lining of the mouth to the beginning of the swallowing tube. They can be cancers that lie within the nasal passages. And importantly, they're cancers such as skin cancers and you know we in Australia really have such a high pro proportion of skin cancer in the world and most of that type of skin cancer develops in the head and neck region so uh, a lot of what we also do is treating advanced skin cancers and the, do those skin cancers are they mainly in the head and neck region because that's just part of life your your face and your neck and ears are in the sun more than any other part of the body yeah, I think that's exactly right. You know, the head and neck region is, you know, kind of sun exposed by the by the simple fact that, you know, you 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 need to have your face exposed to do things and, and interact and carry out your normal activities of daily living. Absolutely. So, so you know, we in Australia really have the highest percentage of skin cancers in the world. You know, everybody talks about melanoma being a really feared cancer, but we must not forget you know, one of the biggest tumour burdens is actually squamous cell carcinoma and basal cell carcinoma, which really makes up the largest proportion of skin cancers uh, that, that we treat. And so just 
Kirsten, given what you've just said um, about it uh, being the, the locations of it and also the kind of um, the functions, the basic functions that it might affect, like swallowing and um, breathing and so on and speaking. Um, so would you say that head and neck cancer can be especially burdensome on patients, perhaps disproportionately so? Yeah, I think that that's right. I mean, it's always very difficult to sort of have one cancer predominate over another. But I think based on the fact that head and neck cancer, if it develops in the throat region, significantly interferes with the sort of common functions uh, in a daily functions, absolutely, you know, and, and not only does it kind of interfere with those critical functions, but it also has significant cosmetic implications. You know, some of our patients who require quite extensive surgery, such as facial or skin removal or, or even jaw, part of jaw removal, you know, they, they will have some cosmetic implications after their treatment. So, you know, I think uh, head and neck cancer is a really challenging cancer because it, it really interferes with those functions. It has cosmetic implications and it's incredibly resource intensive, both in terms of uh, uh, human resource and healthcare resources as a whole. You know, treatments are complex. They require surgery, they need radiation, chemotherapy, and then we must not forget the prolonged rehabilitation that patients uh, require in terms of speech, in terms of swallow, in terms of getting back to their pre-morbid uh, uh, weight, and then all the other psychosocial functions that, uh, that need to be addressed. I would say it is a very complex and difficult and challenging set of cancers to treat. Um, and just finally, Carsten, what, what led you to, to become a head and neck cancer specialist over other specialties? Yeah, look, it's a, look, it's a, it's a really great question. You know, what, what makes us all want to be doctors? You know, I, I, I guess my journey goes back to when I was a, when I was a kid, actually one of my, one of my best friends, uh, when I, who I grew up with really from day one developed leukemia when he was about 10 years old. And so I actually spent quite a lot of time in hospital with him, uh, just cause we were neighbors. He was like my brother. And, and I guess at that particular point in my life, although I didn't quite know what it meant, but I guess I always felt like I wanted to do something, uh, uh, you know, for, for my friend. And I guess that kind of got me into medicine uh, subconsciously, so to speak. And then what got me into, in, into head and neck, I, I guess I, from a, from a, a bit of a personal point of view, it's a, it's a, and this sounds a bit strange, but it's a, it's a great area to treat, you know, it's, it, it, it's got some real challenges. It's got amazing anatomy. It's got amazing functionality. And it, it's just such a privilege to be able to, to, uh, uh, to treat patients with these kind of diseases and in an endeavor to make them better. So I guess from a personal point of view, it's just been a great interest in, in, in the head and neck anatomy and function. Yeah. Mm. Um, Gail, mum, sorry, it's weird calling you Gail. Um, can I bring you in, you in there? Because um, you, you have been involved in head and neck cancer and especially head and neck cancer philanthropy. Um, for many years. So can you, can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, sure, thank you, Juliet. And also uh, thanks to, from me as well to everybody who's joining us today. And thank you very much, Janine, also for you know, joining us on the panel. Um, yeah, I, I think given my rather more advanced age than any of the search, even the head and neck surgeons, uh, I, uh, I've seen a big change in head and neck cancer. I, in fact, going back almost 40 years, was the um, head and neck physiotherapist at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital. And um, we had huge responsibilities, you know, very, very young physios with the, all the trackies and so forth. It was a very, very different scene. There wasn't any reconstruction and the patients would sit in the hospital with big flaps, um, having endured these terrible operations called commandos, which Carsten could expand on. Um, and uh, then, you know, I happened to meet the dashing Chris O'Brien. Uh, we happened to get married. And at one point, he said to me he wanted to specialise in head and neck cancer. To be honest, I was quite horrified because it was such a horrendous specialty from my point of view. 
but it was incredible to see, you know, to travel with him while he got his expertise overseas and brought back reconstructive techniques to Australia, basically um, having done his master's in microsurgical techniques. Um, and uh, as, as we progressed, it's funny how life unfolds. Um, head and neck cancer definitely became our life. Um, and in 2002, uh, Chris decided to um, launch, um, a creator, Sydney, the Sydney Head and Neck Cancer Institute, which was a um, research and, um, you know, it was a fundraising body to, for, for head and neck cancer and research into head and neck cancer. So um, I always think that head and, the head and neck team in at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital was the prototype for the Chris O'Brien Lifehouse because it was dedicated to patients' quality of life and the multidisciplinary approach um, to patient care. And uh, I don't think any other um, modality or any other uh, tumor specialty at um, RPA at that time was um, operating in that way, in the multidisciplinary approach. Uh, by that, I mean that everybody was involved, speech therapists and um, physiotherapists and psychologists, everyone who could as well as the clinicians, of course, um, and uh, social workers. And that really uh, transformed the way head and neck cancer was treated and the approach to it. So with the Sydney Head and Neck Cancer Institute, we launched it with a big ball at what was called the Regent Hotel at the time. I then uh, learned a lot about fundraising um, and we had a ball for 600 people uh, in 2002. I can remember Chris and I just sort of, you know, couldn't believe we'd pulled it off. And uh, we had a theme of pearls because to cover people's neck care, uh, scars and so forth. And um, so that's my, my involvement in fundraising for um, head and neck cancer. And it's just continually progress from there. Um, it's very close to my heart and uh, yeah, that's how it's been. Okay, thanks. So that kind of sets, um, sets the scene of the Sydney Head and Neck Cancer Institute, which um, Karsten, I'll come back and maybe we can talk a, a bit more about that later and the research that the Cancer Institute, the Sydney Head and Neck Cancer Institute has undertaken. Um, but Janine would love to bring you in at this point. So thank you so much again for being here and for being so open and sharing your story with us. Um, so I was wondering if we could start by you telling us how old you were, what position you were in before this all happened. What were you doing? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you so much for involving, involving me in this. Um, I, this is really important to me. Um, so I'm happy to share anything that if you've got any questions at all just feel free to send them through as well um so i first got diagnosed when i was about 18 years old so that's when i first met um dr palm as well um so i was going through my hsc so it was year 12. um i had the ulcer in my mouth so it was in my tongue it, i had it for about a year um and i guess i didn't take it seriously until the end of my HSC. Um, so I think I had other things going on. Um, you know, I had my exams. Um, so I prioritized that over um, getting my ulcer checked out. Um, and I always had ulcers growing up as well. So it always, I've always had it. It always went away after a few days. Um, but this time it just didn't go away after many months. Um, so yeah, it's basically just me in high school, um, just going through the HSC. Wow. And, and so you were doing your HSC um, and you had this ulcer for a long period of time. So can you, can you then take us through what happens next? Yeah. So I finally decided to get it checked out after my HSC. So I mm -hmm. thought, you know what, it's time. It's, it's quite serious. It's surely it's something more serious. It's been there for so many months. Um, so I went to my GP. They then referred me to another doctor who did a biopsy um, and then it came back as cancer. And then I was referred to Dr. Palm straight away. Um, and it was all a very quick process. So um, we did the surgery. We took the aggressive approach to it. So we 
took all of it out. I had some cancer in my lymph nodes as well. Um, so that was taken out. Um, I think Dr. Palm has more specifics to the surgery. Um, but yeah, basically it just all happened, happened really quickly. Yeah. And um, before we go back to um, Carsten, so how are you, how are you at the moment? I'm really good. Yeah. So um, I recovered really well and I'm really fortunate that I had such a good doctor and just a great team in the hospital that really helped me throughout the whole journey. Um, got great family and friends as well that really supported me throughout the whole way as well. Um, so right now, everything is back to normal. Um, so far, the cancer hasn't come back either, which is really good. And I have monthly checkups with um, Professor Palm as well. So everything's good so far. That's fabulous. Um, so Karsten, um can you talk to us a little bit about Janine's diagnosis and in particular um, this issue of tongue cancer in a young person? Yeah, sure. So look, you know, Janine is, is a complete outlier. I mean, you know, somebody at their age of 18 after finishing the HSC when when life is about to start and you're embarking on, you know, I think I vaguely remember you were meant to go overseas after the HSC, you know, you're just not meant to get this kind of a problem. So you can kind of understand why there, there was a reluctance to kind of look after it because you would never think that, you know, you have this kind of awful problem. Uh, you know, tongue cancer or, or mouth cancer is, is generally a, a cancer that we see in a very different population to Janine's. You know, we see it in men, men that are uh, uh, in their 50s and older, men who have a long history of smoking and potentially also drinking. Both of those factors are fairly synergistic. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and then even at that point, tongue cancer is not really that common. If you look at head and neck cancer that develops in the lining of the mouth and the throat, it probably only makes up about 5% of all cancers and tongue cancer and oral cavity cancer or mouth cancer probably only makes up about a third of that. So, you know, the, the numbers certainly in the in Western societies are pretty low. So Janine is, is a complete outlier. I think we in Australia, we, we do see a lot of patients, people from Melanesia and the subcontinent. And there, particularly due to the history of betel nut chewing and palm chewing, mouth cancer is actually far more common. So probably that explains why we end up having a quite a significant experience of this disease, you know, certainly in our institution. But why Janine should get this terrible problem is it really is elusive at this stage and, and quite perplexing. But unfortunately, there appears to be a well-defined trend of this happening. And, and we have recently uh, published a, a paper uh, Lavinia Sagunda Silan, our uh, leading author on this, together with Professor Gupta and Jonathan Clark, uh, and our local colleagues and our international colleagues, having looked at many, many tongue cancers, have identified and confirmed what's been reported around the world that there is a trend of tongue cancer increasing in young women, non smoking patients, you know, and that trend probably relates to about a 5% annual increase every year. And if you look over the past many decades, you know, it, it's a significant disturbing number, you know, and if you do the maths, uh, you know, you look at an almost 300% or greater 300% increase uh, in the occurrence. And at this stage, we, we are not clear of what's going on. What, what, what we are doing, and, and Professor Ruta Gupta, our, our lead, uh, pathologist and researcher together with her team uh, have been doing a lot of basic science research and I think again back on the legacy of, of Chris you know he had the amazing foresight in the in the late 80s to develop a database on head and neck cancer and that database has in, significantly flourished and, and really has become the largest database prospectively collected certainly in Australia and a spin-off of that is that we've developed a tumor banking, which basically means we take tissues uh, after permission from patients such as Janine, 
and we store them for future research. And we probably have the largest database now on young female uh, tongue cancers, certainly in this country. And we have done some preliminary studies and there are some suggestions that something is causing uh, genes to malfunction to cause proliferation, uncontrolled proliferation uh, of cells, which then is, it turns uh, cancerous. What is exactly causing that, uh, that development is yet elusive, but you know, we are working very hard uh, and trying to get more resources and more grants to do further research into that area. Um, and so, sorry, Cass, and just to reiterate, um, so this, this is a, a clear trend in young women only, women, not young men. Yeah, so <clears throat> absolutely, you know, uh, uh, that, that's not to say that it doesn't happen in young men. In fact, you know, I remember when Janine, unfortunately, attended my clinic, I had a, a young chap uh, uh, who was who at the time was 21, who also turned up with a cancer on the same side as Janine's, you know, and I remember treating both very close together. So I think, although we see a clear trend in women, I think we do actually see a number of young men as well developing, but it's not as well defined a set as we have seen in young women. Um, so Janine, sorry, I don't, don't want to kind of, you know, rake over it too much, but we, we just kind of want to reflect on this issue of being so young, um, you know, Carsten's outlines what would usually kind of might be linked with tongue cancer, smoking, um, uh, did you say chewing, what do you say? Chewing in, in kind of Papua New Guinea and so on. Yeah, so <clears throat> if you look at, if you look at countries such as India and Melanesia, you know, the biggest risk factor is betel nut chewing. In India, there is something called pan, which is a, which is kind of a concoction uh, of tobacco and 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 betel nut uh, that people chew as a habit, you know. And and if you look at the numbers, there are probably around 400 million people on this earth chewing betel nut, right? Wow. But, so I've been to PNG a number of times, and and actually women. Uh, the women in PNG lead the world in the highest number of tongue and oral cancers in the world, you know, by, by a long shot, you know. And unfortunately, a lot of these patients present at incredibly advanced stages simply because it's nearly impossible for them to access care, any type of care. And then when they do, you know, it takes a, a, a lot of effort uh, to reach an area where they m might be treated. So, Janine, no, um, no betel nut chewing, though, in your history. No. <laughs> so, it must have been a, I mean, it must have just kind of knocked you. Like, it must have been just the biggest shock. That yeah, been so yeah, for sure. I, I remember it was such a shock. I remember feeling very upset when I first found out as well. Um, but, like, deep down, I knew there was something wrong. Um, so it wasn't a complete shock where it came out of nowhere. I, I didn't know that there was something wrong. Um, yeah, it was definitely very scary. Um, it was during a time where, you know, everyone was going on schoolies and going on holidays or hanging out with friends after high school. Um, yeah, and then I just had to be in hospital. Um, but, you know, it was, you know, my health was more important. It was more important than anything. So, um, yeah. And can you just tell us a little bit more about how the treatment affected you? Um, I mean, being, you know, your tongue. So, yeah. and, and in that particular stage of life, can you tell, tell us about that? Yeah. Um, I think at first we were quite worried that my speech would be impaired in some way. Um, but I've been very fortunate um, that that hasn't been the case. Um, sometimes I do talk with a bit of a lisp at times, but that's pretty much the only issue um, in terms of um, eating as well. I haven't had any issues at all with my eating. Um, and yeah, it's just not, my life hasn't been affected that much in that sense. Um, I, I think it was a really good recovery. Um, and so there hasn't been too many changes in terms of 
um, the way I still live my life. Can we just, um, that might, can we talk about those issues of um, your speech and your swallowing? Um, first of all, can, can, Janine, can you tell me about the sorts of people who were involved in your treatment? Because it sounds like there are a few different elements there. And Gail mentioned before this um, issue of multidisciplinary care. So um, Carsten and Gail will get you to talk a little bit about what multidisciplinary care is in a moment. But Janine, if you could just take us through you as a patient and some different people who you had contact with during this time. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the main person would be Professor Palm. So he was my doctor, um, the surgeon as well. Um, I then had um, Dr. Clark who did the reconstructive surgery. So he took um, a skin graft from my groin area and that was um, put into where they took out the cancer on my tongue. Um, so, well, can I just ask you a question there? So yeah. was that in the same operation or did you have? Yeah, that was within the same operation. So it was quite a long procedure. I think it took around, I can't remember exactly, but I think it was about a 16 hour operation, oh, something yeah. along those lines. Yeah. And so um, two surgical teams. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then I had the nurses at Lifehouse who really helped me out when I was in ICU and when I got moved into just the normal wards. Um, I spoke to a speech pathologist as well, a dietitian, um, an immunologist as well after that. Yeah, so it was qu quite a long process. A lot of people were involved. Um, Carsten, can you tell us about that, the, these different elements um, with the, the patient at the centre and then it sounds like there are multiple different specialists who, yeah. who will treat the patient? Well, I think, um, I think, you know, Janine has really been the beneficiary of, of, of really what Chris set up, you know, many, many years ago and, and a, a massive beneficiary of this concept of multidisciplinary care that Gail alluded to earlier. And I, and I would agree that head and neck has probably been one of the first specialties that's really maximised the use of a team approach to get it right, you know, and, and I think Janine is a, is a perfect example of this. And as much as I, 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 I'm here today, I, I'm only a very small part of, of this team and really a team that Janine looked after. So, you know, we had John, my good colleague, help with the reconstruction and then the enormous amount of people in the hospital from our nurses, speech therapists, dietitians, psychologists, our junior doctors, our fellows, ward clerks, <clears throat> who all work together to, to achieve one outcome and, and, and that outcome is to, to get the best result for the patient. And, and again, if you look at, uh, uh, we have looked at that critically and, and, and unfortunately or fortunately that the more you do, the better you get at it. And we have clearly demonstrated that the more patients like Janine you treat, the better outcomes you achieve. And, and I think it's really important to focus on the fact that best outcomes are achieved by this multidisciplinary approach. Now, fortunately, <clears throat> Janine did not have to see other members of our team, which are uh, incredibly important. And these are our radiation oncologists, our medical oncologists, you know, our pathologists clearly are integral in being able to tell us what we have achieved in terms of the surgery, you know, what have been the tumour margins? They're the ones who, you know, endlessly spend endless hours looking over specimens uh, that we then all discuss together to make sure that we can develop a prompt, personalised approach uh, for every individual patient. And really, the aim is to return patients back to normalcy. You know, to turn them, return them to normal life. And I guess that is something I'm very pleased that, that we've been able to achieve in Janine. And, and I guess her being here today after, you know, four years of this event is really testimony to the team and the excellent team approach at Lifehouse. Um, Gail, can we, you, you know, you mentioned earlier the, um, the, the origins of this and that the, the Sydney Head and Neck Cancer Institute it's about research, but there was also the element of multidisciplinary care um, going back uh, 20 years or so in head and neck cancer. 
Um, that has come a long way and really this multidisciplinary approach, but also patient centered approach. So, you know, at, at Chris O'Brien Life House, we say treating the patient, not just the disease. And it seems like Janine is a, perf is a, is a good example of that, where it's not just about removal of the tumour, but it's um, about um, reconstruction as well, obviously, but also focusing on quality of life issues like speech and swallowing. So just wonder if you can tell us a little bit about um, this notion of multidisciplinary and patient-centred care and how it's really extended beyond the head and neck cancer unit into Lifehouse in general. Okay, yes, thank you, Juliet. Um, I think that looking at Janine, um, you, you would never imagine how massive the surgery has been. And if she had have had um, her cancer when I was a young physio, as I described before, she'd be immensely disfigured. Um, and her quality of life would have been not very good at all, as you can imagine. She'd have been in the hospital for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. And um, to be honest, she wouldn't have been very well supported. Um, so done, uh, as it is today, uh, and with my background in allied health, I um, uh, enjoy and am privileged to be a, a part of the um, allied health team. I am the patient advocate here and uh, I'm a director, as you said, but I'm on the wards as well. Um, so every Tuesday with the Allied Health team uh, for Head and Neck, we meet for an hour and we discuss every single patient on the ward. So in that, in that meeting, uh, the nurses, the specialist nurses for Head and Neck, and there are the speech therapists, there are the uh, dietitians, there are um, the physiotherapists, there, and there are the psychologists and the social workers. Uh, so the clinicians aren't in there. It's purely a, um, a, an allied health supportive care um, uh, meeting. And if anybody, uh, and separately from that, there is a meeting on Thursdays with um, the living room. So living room is our well-being area. And we discuss patients who might need um, complementary therapies. You know, we, we do have, uh, take this holistic approach at um, Chris O'Brien Lighthouse and um, I must say that I was a thorn in people's sides about having that available to people when we were developing the hospital because you know, you know, Chris and I sorted out ourselves even though he was a man of science it was you know the whole vision changed to having a holistic approach to, to care which gives patients hope and that's what we're all about here. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, as I say, the, um, I'm, I've forgotten the, the beginning of your question now, Julia, but it was about the multidisciplinary care, wasn't it? And, yeah. um, <clears throat> you know, I just want to touch on also on the fact of, and Carsten said, uh, the expertise here, um, we have such a, a huge volume of patients here. We have, um, you know, um, what percentage of the state, Carson, do we, we treat in terms of head and neck cancer? We probably treat around about 20 to 30 percent of the head and neck cancer in this state, yeah. Yeah, so the volume is huge. So if Janine were to go to another hospital um, where they don't have anything like that volume, her, her experience would be a lot different from coming to the Chris O'Brien Life House. Just to, just to maybe make a comment on that, I think one of the, one of the real problems with head and neck cancer in, in our state is that we have 75 institutions uh, registered doing complex head and neck cases. And, and there is a huge spread in numbers per year. We, a benchmark was set by the Cancer Institute of a minimum caseload of 25 cases a year. And there's probably only about 10 institutions that achieve that. If we look at, at Lifehouse, we perform over 200 complex procedures per year. So we, again, it's unfortunate on one hand, but I guess fortunate on the other, treat by far the most complex head and neck cancer cases in this state. 
Sebastian, what's the what's the benefit to a patient of going to a facility with higher volume? Yeah, look, I think it. I guess it is an intuitive uh, uh, benefit. You know, the more you do, the better you get. But you need to actually prove that. You know, there's a lot of a, a lot of talk about uh, we do the largest numbers and then therefore we have the best outcomes. But un unless you actually analyze your own data and look at what you're doing, it's very difficult to draw that conclusion. I would, I can confidently say that we do achieve that uh, related to the Cancer Institute outcomes showing that our complication rates, our survival rates are significantly less than the state average. One particular example in terms of Janine's case is that we did a study with our colleagues in Brisbane looking at a surgeon that performs tongue cancer cases. And we have shown that if a surgeon performs more than 20 cases a year, that adds 10 to 20% to the survival of that patient. And I think that's something you need to really think about carefully. So if you go to a surgeon that treats less than 20 cases a year, 10 to 20% of patients will survive less than if they've gone to a high volume surgeon. And that's a paper that uh, we published last year with our colleagues uh, in Brisbane and the senior author was Dr. Liu. So this, this is really important evidence and these are really important factors that certainly, and I don't like using that term, but the consumer or the public needs to be aware of. It's one thing saying that you are the most high volume surgeon, but you actually need to prove that what you do gives the desired outcome. And I can say with confidence and pride in our unit here at Lifehouse that we do perform the most surgery, but we also have some of the best outcomes. Mm. Um, can I just come in yeah, there? Please. As, as Karsten said, it's not just Karsten saying it and the team saying it and me saying it, but this is evident, this is data that has come out from the Can New South Wales Cancer Institute but in the reporting for better outcomes data that we are, you know, someone who comes here to a facility like this, in, partic in particular our facility, has a 40% better chance of survival in one year. Um, okay, so best outcomes um, derived from treating the most patients in a multidisciplinary setting. Um, I actually have a question um, here from uh, Brian. Uh, before, before I ask that, can we just um, address this issue of uh, access to this sort of care? Um, so, Janine, whereabouts do you live? How did you come to be referred to, to Professor Palm and so on and come into Lifehouse? Yeah, so I live in the Castle Hill area, so I would say that access to healthcare is readily available. Um, and that's, I've been very fortunate with that. So I just went to my local GP. Um, and wow. then from then on, it was just a referral. So it was very quick, very easy. And um, but I would say that, yeah, if I was living in another area, maybe somewhere rural, um, I would not have the same access. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'd love to talk a little bit more about that um but first can we can we just um Carsten, i've got a question here from brian um yeah. i had base of tongue cancer in 2002 requiring radical jaw resection and radiation are there any keyhole techniques that impact oral surgery today yeah look uh, uh I'm, I'm i'm glad that brian's had excellent treatment so so and uh, and he's had successful treatment what one of the, the real issues, base of tongue cancer, uh, the concept of what causes base of tongue cancer has undergone a massive change in the past two decades. Initially, you know, uh, these kind of cancers, again, were part of the classic smoking, drinking uh, uh, variety. However, what we have realized over the past two decades, that base of tongue cancers, which form uh, cancers within a group called oropharynx cancers develop in a lot of young 
men, non-smokers in their 40s and 50s who don't actually have the traditional risk factors. And it has been identified now that the human papillomavirus is the cause of these type of cancers. And we have also realized that these type of cancers behave completely differently to those cancers that have been caused by traditional risk factors and smoking. So the reason why I say that is because the treatment for base of tongue cancer has undergone a significant shift over the, you know, over the past two to three decades. Traditionally, people were treated with open surgery. And as Brian uh, alluded to in his question, with uh, uh, dividing the jaw and, and very morbid resection then people felt that the complication rates and the side effects were significant. The chemo radiation treatment uh, was favored uh, sort of in the 80s and 90s. Then we identified this subgroup of patients who have HPV related cancers. And that we have to understand that risk of HPV related cancer, and the numbers have increased by two to 300% over the last two to three decades, to the point that if this continues within the next 10 years, more than half of all the head and neck cancers we will we'll see will be HPV related oropharynx cancers. Right? And the classic risk factors are non-smoking males in high socioeconomic background. And we have found that patients who are treated with chemo radiation and modern chemo radiation techniques do incredibly well uh, in terms of surviving this disease and sparing vital upper air digestive tract function. And in answer to, his, to Brian's question, yes, the surgical robot has uh, uh, caused a bit of a paradigm shift in the way we treat these cancers in a way to try and minimize even the effects of high quality radiation because they do have implications for swallowing saliva and taste. So at the moment, exactly how his cancer would have been treated really rests on what has caused his cancer and the stage of his cancer. But the two treatments really now are either chemotherapy and radiation or indeed some form of minimally invasive robotic removal followed by possibly radiation and chemotherapy. Sorry, and it's a long answer, but I, it, 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 it's, it's not quite as simple. I think in short answer, yes, we have wonderful techniques, but wonderful techniques don't necessarily lead to the best treatment. You know, I think the key in any patient goes back to what we talked about earlier. We need to just have all the facts at hand and these patients all need to go through a high volume expert multidisciplinary team so that the appropriate evidence-based prompt personalized care can be allocated to the individual. Okay, so of that, um... Can I just first acknowledge that, um, and mum, you're on mute, just FYI, um, but uh, Eileen Hannigan, who's the CEO of Chris O'Brien Lifehouse, has just joined Gail. Hi, Eileen. Thank you for Hi, joining you. us. <laughs> um, before you sat down, Janine just had just mentioned um, how lucky she was to be able to access the type of care that Carsten has just described. Um, uh, based on where she lives um, and that if she was in a rural or regional area she might not have been able to access that sort of care and we've just heard Carsten talk about um, that incredible care and very high level techniques and so on. So I'd like to ask Eileen and Carsten about what Chris O'Brien Lifehouse is doing in rural and regional areas to try to expand this level of care. Um, Carsten, can we start with you and then go to Eileen? So I think that, that the real challenge is, is for, for, for patients and their general practitioners to identify those 
practitioner specialist that will give them the best outcome. And this goes back to the original challenge about defining what is head and neck cancer. And, and, and this is a challenge that we face because of the difficulty to explain our specialty versus breast cancer or colorectal cancer. Also because the numbers of this disease are lower, there are less specialist centers that treat these patients with, with good effect. So I think that's a really big challenge. And when Janine came to me, she wasn't referred to Lifehouse, she was referred to me as an individual. Uh, and for, for some uh, uh, reason, you know, her GP, uh, uh, you know, sends patients to me because they've had a previous experience. But it, 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 this is, in a way, it's a little bit lucky because depending on what sort of relationship the, the GP has with other specialists, that's what's going to direct where the patient goes. So I think it is a challenge. And I think uh, it, it's a challenge that we can that we um, that that we, we can overcome, but it's going to require education. It's re it's going to require information. Information will empower not just patients but also the general practitioners. So I think forums like this are incredibly vital in terms of educating and informing people. You know what are the possibilities out there for their disease, and I think as Janine alluded to. The, the issues are far more complex in the regions because in the regions, although the regions are, are, are resourced incredibly well these days, there are fantastic specialists who've dedicated their life to working in the regions. But again, because head and neck cancer is not that common, the regions can't sustain high-end uh, high specialists when you, don't, you only see a handful of patients a year. And I guess to me, that was obvious about three or four years ago when, when we were getting a number of patients for the regions. And, and again, taking a step back, when a cancer is common, we can allow the specialist to move to the population with the cancer. If a cancer is uncommon, we require that cancer to move to a specialist center. So what I thought about was a bit of a hybrid model. So we explored this when we set up our Port Macquarie Regional Head and Neck Clinic about three or four years ago, where I felt that one of the easiest ways to support the regions by us running regular clinics and educate the local healthcare district, work with the local healthcare district but allow them for patients to turn up, be evaluated, be worked up at home without having to travel big distances, be displaced from their social lives and their work, and then work with the local healthcare district to formulate a plan. That's what we've done at Port Macquarie with some success. That is what we've done now at Tamworth. We have now surgeons going to Orange and also in Nara. And we've had a massive support, uh, recently uh, philanthropic support, and we have now uh, uh, hired a regional care coordinator within our unit for head and neck that is going to improve the clinical, the education, and the research that we can offer in the regions. Eileen, can you tell us um, about this, this um, about the regional and rural cancer program and um, Carson also just referenced philanthropy. So the, how that, that's being funded and expanded. So, the, so importantly, people need to understand that 60% of our patients come from rural and regional. So there's a lot of patients that do manage to find their way to Lifehouse. We, our vision is a collaborative approach with the region so that where appropriate, we facilitate care as close to home as possible. That includes the satellite clinics that customers refer to, but it also refers giving patients access to our multidisciplinary clinics so they get the expert advice about where that care is appropriate. So we often will do the definitive surgery for patients in particularly complex cancers like Carsten's talked about head and neck or gynae-oncology, or upper GI, we will do the definitive surgery here, but we will make um, contact and communicate with the local community and facilitate where we can 
the uh, chemotherapy and radiotherapy close to home. It's all about trying to maintain that contact with the community that the patient comes from and the clinicians that they come from. We need, as uh, Carsten said, to educate, but also build the trust with the local communities and the medical communities in the regions so that they understand the patient always is theirs and it's a shared approach to the care. That's important. The, unfortunately, some of the challenges we've faced in building our satellite centres, and I think our strategy is to get to eight this year, has been the cost impost. It's really quite difficult when there's no real funding. We've had the exciting opportunity of a considerable donation this year that's allowed us, as Carsten said, the care coordinator, and really to look at then how we grow this and present a model to the state that um, shows the improved benefit of outcomes by patients coming to us for that definitive care, but also the multidisciplinary team advice to the local community back home. Yeah, and, and if I could make another comment, because I think, uh, you know, Eileen's articulated that a lot better than me, but, but it's exactly spot on. The, the, the big issue here is, is that we are a, a, a not-for-profit public-private partnership, and, and, and through this, we actually can deliver true equity in care, not just to private, but also public patients. So what our vision, and certainly my vision has been with LifeHouse, is to really deliver this care not just to private patients. In fact, it's the public patients that we really want to look after. And I think we are the only institution that can do this. The, the public hospitals, unfortunately, through their, their LHD commitments, find it very difficult to run outreach clinics and purely private institutions find it very difficult from their shareholder interest. So I think we from LifeHouse are the only hospital that has shown the interest and, you know, that, that the amazing executive support and leadership that Eileen has given us and the opportunity to explore this because there would be no other institution that can provide this. And I, and I, and I, and I have to say, unfortunately, we can only do this through us doing it. We have no government support at any level to look after regional patients. So this has been an, an entire effort by LifeHouse. And unfortunately, there is a cost burden to patients because otherwise this, pro this process and this will just not be possible. But it is continuing to be our aim and our efforts to make uh, our healthcare system, our government understand the importance of this service and fund this so we can expand and improve outcomes for these patients. Thanks, Carsten. So Eileen and Gail, and Eileen, please uh, start with what you were just going to say. But my question was going to be what, um, what role does philanthropy play in all of this? So I think importantly over the last six years, we've worked really hard at making LifeHouse as a hospital to pay for itself operationally to support the functions that you would normally expect a hospital to be able to support. But there are so many things that differentiate LifeHouse from many other hospitals and organisations such as the regional centres and those kind of things. And it is only through philanthropy that we can do those. You know, a hospital, um, like any other pr private hospital and clinic setup we have, we have gain the revenue that supports the operational function and the clinics and its natural growth and it's the support of the basic infrastructure of the organisation. But the research, the extra clinical nurses, the fellows and the trainees are all supported by philanthropy. Because of the public-private partnership, as Carsten said, we have unique opportunities but we also have unique challenges we don't get an access to a statewide education and trading grant for our fellowship. We probably have upwards of 10 fellows now training in specific specialty areas of advanced tumour surgery uh, that will go out and benefit the rest of the state and Australia. And we do that through our philanthropy. That's, there are so many things that are enabled here through the generous giving of our community. It's just amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Gail, can you, can you tell us a little bit of, more about the interest in, about what philanthropy has funded most recently in, in Head and Neck? Okay. Um, and, and also whatever you were just about to say. <laughs> well, um, Marlene just deferred to me for a moment, so I was going to just add to what she said and Carsten in that, um, you know, I, uh, I always think of us not just being the, the two P's, private, private and public, but the three P's, private, public and philanthropy. And um, there's no doubt, uh, you know, it, it enhances and enables our charitable purpose. We're, we're not for profit. Uh, we, um, you know, we're the, the first comprehensive cancer hospital in, in Australia, um, you know, and I think there's a lot of, um, there are, there's, um, you know, it gets complicated in the terminology and comprehensive means the, you know, everything's under one roof, it's a whole, uh, and then there's the complication of it being integrated. You can have an integration without comprehend, a comprehensive center. So we, we have both, we have a comprehensive center that is, that has a charitable purpose, everything's integrated, uh, and it is underpinned with, with research, because a lot of places don't have research. And um, if we didn't have the uh, philanthropy to help us with clinical trials and the, the research, well, our whole, our whole mission of, um, uh, would be affected. And that is, our mission is about quality of life. So, um, you know, we depend on philanthropy for that. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. That, um, that does bring us up to 11.30. Um, I can't see any more questions from the floor in my Q&A box, but if you do have any questions whatsoever, um, then you can contact Rebecca, who I believe that everyone in this forum would already be familiar with Rebecca through the invitations um, and have her email address. But um, otherwise, I think I'll draw things to a close. So I want to thank everyone very much for being here. And thank you, Eileen, for dropping in at the end. Can I just add to that, darling, because I am... Um, oh, sorry, Juliet. And <laughs> 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 um, that, you know... I did touch on philanthropy and, and of course, you know, we're under pressure here because we're on Zoom, but, you know, there are just so many things that philanthropy helps, including, and uh, at the very top of the list there is hardship. You know, not everybody can afford cancer treatment, even though, um, you know, um, it is a costly, it's a costly exercise for people mm -hmm. and their finances are affected. So one of the things that is close to um, our hearts is supporting people who, who are in strife um, financially and, uh, you know, philanthropy helps us with those people. So it's, it's not just the people who can afford it. Mm -hmm. um, and just briefly, when you say hardship, Eileen, how, how is that, how do we assist people with hardship? Is that through a particular scholarships or funds? Or? So, no, it's about individual clinicians approach us and we have a very defined process to assess hardship because there's limited funds, but it can be anything from supporting patients to buy their medication to accessing surgery they might not otherwise be able to have to supporting them in local accommodation and sometimes even travel allowances or even helping them to go home to an apartment or a home with some food in the fridge. So it varies dramatically about what the personal needs are for each family or person. And, and we try and assess those needs and provide the access to the funds with a degree of equality, really. Mm. So the social work department does get involved to make sure that we're giving the money where it's truly going to provide the greatest benefit. Thank you. Well, that I think that does definitely round out everything that we've heard today about this particular unit, head and neck cancer, and um, the um, pioneering research that Carsten had talked about earlier, um, the advanced care 
the focus on the patient and individual quality of life, expanding access to care, and also uh, through both regions and rural areas and also socioeconomic access. So um, I think we've covered a lot of ground today, but um, anyone who's on the forum and wants to learn more can definitely contact Rebecca and we'd be very happy to share. But this is really just a thank you and an information sharing session. So thank you to our panelists. Um, thank you, Gail and Eileen. Thank you, Professor Palm Carsten. And thank you very much to Janine for being so open and sharing your story with us. And we're so we're delighted that you look and seem so so well. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Okay, everyone, we'll leave it there. Thank you again. Thanks, Juliet. Thank you, Juliet.